Hello, and welcome to This Week in the Canadian Revolution, a podcast by Fightback, the Marxist voice of labor and youth. We live in a revolutionary epoch. The crisis of the capitalist system is creating political polarization and instability in every single country, as millions of people look for a way out. The product of this is unprecedented social upheaval and yes, revolution. Now we firmly believe that the crisis of capitalism is creating the conditions for socialist revolution. Yes, even in Canada. The point of this podcast is to provide a Marxist analysis of what Trotsky described as the molecular process of socialist revolution. Week in, week out, we will help prepare activists in Canada and internationally for the coming revolutionary events by analyzing all of the developments in Canada. We hope that you can join us every week. With that being said, let's get into it. This week in the Canadian Revolution, uh, we're going to take a bit of a detour and uh, we're going to talk about inflation, uh, the rising cost of living. Uh, is obviously a pressing question for millions of people, I'd say billions of people around the world. Uh, but this is not unrelated to the conflict over Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, uh, which has caused a rising cost of, in particular, oil and gas that has a knock-on effect in the market. I think it's at over $2 uh, in many places uh, in Canada, which is the highest that it's ever been. Um, but yeah, what is going on? We've seen rising inflation. Uh, the consumer price index is over 5% uh, just this past January, uh, which is the highest since September 1991. Uh, connected to this, wages have largely been stagnant. So this is a wage cut in all but name. Over 50% uh, of respondents in an Angus Reid poll have therefore said that their finances are being overtaken by the rising costs of everything from gas to groceries. Um, so yeah, this is a pressing question for working class people. Uh, rich people don't mind so much. They can, they can afford it, but working class people uh, are increasingly unable to afford the rising cost of living. Uh, now we've mentioned uh, uh, many different things going on here. Uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, there is what comes to mind <laughs> even before the war in Ukraine is the supply chain disruptions, mostly due to COVID. Um, but uh, uh, there are other elements at play here. Uh, I have with me, once again, Alex Grant, editor of Fightback, who is going to help us sort of unpack this. Uh, we'll get into what inflation is, where it comes from, what the different ideas in the movement are, uh, what the left says, what the right says about it, and, and what the solution, the socialist solution uh, to this problem is. Uh, but yeah, I'll pass it over to Alex. So what, yeah, what is going on? What is causing this rising inflation? Yeah, thanks, Joel. Great to chat again. And there's many processes at play here. And, and it's really important for us as socialists to take this seriously. There's some people on the left say, I don't have to worry about inflation. You yeah, really do. Working class people, when they fill up their car and when it used to be $50 and then it's 70 and now it may go up to $100 to fill their uh, tank full of gas, then that really affects people. It makes people thousands of dollars poorer every year. It's not the, the war isn't just the two dollar oil. It's also wheat prices. Ukraine is a major wheat producer that's being cut off. So that's going to filter down to everything. But this, yes, there are many processes that contribute to inflation. The other one that you mentioned was supply chain disruptions. This is the illogical anarchy of capitalism, that it's on the basis of, you know, anarchic uh, topologies to my anarchist friends, supply and demand. And during COVID, there was a major shift from services to commodities. People couldn't do stuff, so they bought things. And uh, the economy couldn't, uh, collaborate for that, recalibrate for that, sorry. And, uh, and that has led to temporary inflation in some areas until production comes back into balance. But other elements, which are a bit more interesting, 
On the one side, you've got corporate profiteering. And on the other side, you've got the reduced value of money. And, and I think that's probably the most interesting areas for us to sort of concentrate our discussion is in terms of corporate profiteering and the reduced value of money to, to really get to the heart of this question and a solution going on beyond you know, specific crises. Yeah, I, before we get into this, actually, I think we do need to put a nail in a coffin of a common argument that's raised by conservative economists. Uh, they kind of harp on, they think wages, increased wages cause inflation. This is an age old argument going all the way back to Marx's day. But yeah, maybe, I don't know, you can give us a quick argument of why that is not, why that is not true, why that's not correct. Do wages well, cause, in, cause inflation? Well, empirically, it clearly is not causing inflation right now. Wages have been totally flat. Historically, wages have been pushed down. Workers are working harder and harder and harder and getting nothing. And yet inflation is rampant. So clearly wages are not in cause uh, inflation practically, but also wages don't cause inflation theoretically. Explain why. The reality is what is value? What is value? That is the amount of socially necessary labor time contained within a commodity. So labor, labor is value. That's the ABCs of Marxist economics. Now, if when a commodity is produced, it is on average sold at its value. And so if it takes 10 hours, it's exchanged for 10 hours of other commodities. That's what happens. And then that value is split up within the commodity. Okay, you've got 10 hours labor. Let's say five hours of that is machinery, raw materials. It's called constant capital in Marxist terms. That's old labor, dead labor from previous rounds of production. And then you've got new labor produced by the worker. So you've got, let's say you've got five hours constant capital and five hours new labor put in by the worker. But then that's split up. That's split up between the worker, wages, this is called variable capital, and profits, surplus value. So if you increase wages, if you increase variable capital, does that mean that this commodity takes more than 10 hours to produce? No, it doesn't. The commodity still took 10 hours to produce. It's still exchanged for 10 hours. The only difference is if you increase variable capital, surplus value goes down proportionately. And similarly, if you decrease wages, profits, surplus value goes up. It doesn't change the value, the final value of the commodity. So wages do not create inflation one little bit. You can study that empirically, but theoretically it is bunk. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. I think, you know, basically you have the class struggle that is a fight over the surplus value <laughs> produced. Uh, and that is what is happening now. And that is what has happened in the past. And uh, it is if, if corporations, uh, uh, they, they, they have to sell their products on a market. They, they, it's not just, uh, I, I, I think that the, it, it becomes quite obvious in this instance in particular that, that the wages are not going up and they're making record profits. And this, I think, leads directly into the question of corporate profiteering, because you get the right wing that says inflation is caused by increased wages, which is obviously bullshit because that's not what's happening now. Uh, but then you also have the, uh, the, the, I think like the Bernie Sanders type, Bernie crew, uh, probably some NDP lefts. I don't know if this is what they argue. Um, but yeah, general left wing people that argue that, oh, inflation is, is simply caused by corporate profiteering. It's like, capitalists being deciding to be especially greedy um but i don't know do you want to what do you, what do you what would you say to that well there's a, there's an element of that there's a very clear element of that that what i previously said of prices equaling value at socially necessary labor time that assumes free exchange and when you've got monopolies when you've got large corporations cornering various elements of the market. They can artificially push up prices and they can profiteer. And there's been some studies done by left-wing economists saying that 
corporations are profiteering. One of them stated that 60% of inflation is corporate profiteering. People have objected to some of his numbers, a bit of a bit of back of the envelope calculations, but it's clear that there's an element of this. There's corporations going in there just arbitrarily raising prices because they can and seeing if they can get away with it. And uh, and so, yes, that is a part of it, but it's not all of it because these reformists are the same people who are saying, look, print money, modern monetary theory, this kind of stuff. We don't have to worry about the value of money, that nothing like that. And so they, they're saying, don't worry about inflation. It's just corporate profiteering. So, and also the reformist solutions to corporate profiteering are very, very, very modest. It's tax the rich. And, and the reality is if you tax the rich, they won't invest. So our, you know, when it really comes down to it, if there is corporate profiteering, well, you need workers control. You need to open the books. You need to open the books to see if they are profiteering. And really you can't control what you don't own. You need nationalization to stop corporate profiteering. That's the, the real solution, but the yeah, you know, but it's not just profiteering, and the profiteering does not explain the full story in, in any way. Yeah, so that's that is also clearly an element in this situation. But yeah, as I think as you explained, it doesn't get to the root of it, and also identifying corporate profiteering is one thing. Solving it is another, and that is not something that can be done under capitalism. That is a built-in component of the capitalist system. So uh, I think in order to understand all of this stuff, maybe we should do a little bit of theory. <laughs> you get you get into kind of like nebulous questions of what is money anyway? Uh, some people sort of almost suggest that it's just fake. It's just <laughs> money in and of itself is just made up. It's not really related to anything. Uh, you mentioned modern monetary theory. That is not exactly what's ar argued by, by modern moner monetary theory, but some people, it's almost suggested that it, it sort of doesn't matter. You can just create it endlessly. But before we get into that stuff, I think maybe we should get into uh, Alex. I know has read quite a bit of Das Kapital, Marx, what Marx's seminal work. Uh, chapter three of Volume One goes into this question. Now, Alex is going to try to give us a summary of Capital uh, th Chapter Three, Volume One, uh, in under three minutes, uh, and maybe that will that will allow us to get to the to 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 kind of understand these ideas being debated in the movement and which. Which ideas are, are the right ideas? Which ideas actually don't make any sense? But uh, I don't know. Are you ready here, Alex? Yeah, I, I actually, Joel, I want you to time me. To tell me exactly how long it takes me to explain chapter three. Okay. I will. One, we will two, see. Three, go. All right. So if you, if you imagine primitive human societies, various tribes, and bef this is the pre-class society, the, the verge of a new class society. And various different uh, communities, they'd be good at producing some things and bad at producing others. Like, say, uh, one group had, had a bunch of goats and another group had fish or something like that. And they'd spontaneously come into contact with each other and say, we've got too many goats, you've got too many fit, fish, let's swap them, let's barter. And so that's kind of accidental exchange. But as societies develop and there is a permanent organic surplus, these accidental exchanges became habitual. And when they're accidental, the, the exchange ratio is quite arbitrary. It it's really is quite subjective on the, on the various needs of the different communities. But when it becomes habitual, various different communities specialize. They specialize in what they're best at. And, and, and like nomadic uh, uh, tribes, they, they would very often specialize in animal husbandry, goats, camels, uh, sheep, etc. Then you've got more stable communities don't move around. You know, they, they can have agriculture, stuff like that. Anyway, so as these sort of habitual exchanges happen, then the exchange ratio becomes the amount of labor in those exchanges. So it ceases to be accidental goats or accidental fish, and it becomes 
a thousand hours of goats for a thousand hours of fish or a thousand hours of wheat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the labor theory of value. That's how it historically evolved. Now, it's kind of a pain to always be changing goats for fish and stuff like that. What if you want half a goal or et cetera? And so that's where money came in. Uh, precious metals, gold, silver, et cetera, became an intermediate. So you didn't have to exchange a whole commodity. You could subdivide it. And also a very small amount of gold contains a very large amount of labor. So you could do goats for gold, gold, gold for fish, fish to gold, gold to wheat, right? And so it becomes a medium of exchange. But we should remember, money's not value. Money is the measurement of value. It's the intermediate. So that's 5,000 or so years ago. Let's bring it up to the 20th century. Gold standard ends up uh, entering into crisis because capitalism is an extreme crisis, especially in the 20s and 30s. And the trouble with gold standard is that it's a completely stable amount of labor. And so every crisis is felt right here, right now. And so the capitalist economy started abandoning the gold standard so that they can play with the value of money to get themselves out of an extreme crisis. For example, in 1919, there was a global revolutionary movement. And if there was, a, and the economy needed austerity, Trotsky explained this, the economy needed austerity in 1919, but if they put through austerity, then the revolutions would have all won. So they put off the austerity in order to defeat the revolutions without antagonizing all of the working class, and then they put in the, the austerity a few years later. So they, they moved away from the gold standard to fiat currency. This is where, where people get confused. We're no longer on commodity currency. Currency no longer represents you know, the actual labor time it used to create that gold. Now it's kind of arbitrary. There is a, modern currencies are an arbitrary amount of value that it is just, they are imaginary pieces of paper, but central banks kind of regulate how much currency is in the economy to limit inflation to about 2%. And they do that with the interest rate, central bank's interest rate. So the interest rate determines how much imaginary money is created. So if the interest rate is low, then private banks can then take lots of money at a very low interest rate and then lend it on for capitalists to invest. If the interest rate is high, this leaves less of a margin of profit for private banks to lend it on to capitalists to invest. And so the interest rate goes up and down is how they regulate the money supply. And so low interest rates, lots of created imaginary money low value of money, high interest rates, not as much imaginary money, um, higher value of money. There, how long did that take? Five and a half minutes. Oh, damn. Although <laughs> your, your explanations from capital before you got into the gold standard stuff was about three minutes. So, you know, we'll give it, we'll give it to you there. <laughs> nice, thank you, John. But anyway, thank you very much, Alex. I, that, that, I think that actually gives us a pretty good theoretical foundation because a lot, this is a big debate. It's a big confusion in the moon. People, I think, have, don't know what money is entirely. So once we have a firm understanding of, of, of what, what this phenomena, really the social phenomena of money is, then that will really help us to ascertain um, yeah, what is actually going on and what we can do about it. Um, so yeah, I guess you mentioned increasing interest rates. Uh, the Bank of Canada has started increasing interest rates. Actually, they've they've wanted to. Banks have wanted to increase interest rates over the last year or more, uh, but they've delayed that because they've been very concerned with the COVID and the Omicron wave. They've delayed, but they know that they must <laughs> increase interest rates uh, precisely because inflation is going up, right? So the the rising cost of of of, of, uh, of goods and services. Uh, is biting people, as we've already explained, and uh, 
uh, yeah, the, the rising, rising the interest rate is going to basically deter people from borrowing money. It's going to deter the, <laughs> there being more debt and more basically fictitious capital in the market. Uh, and therefore, it will put a downward pressure on um, prices on, and, and theoretically should, should put a damper on that inflation. Uh, however, uh, as I think there was an economist, not a Marxist by any means, uh, David Rosenberg, who said, uh, there's no getting out, there is no getting out of jail free card. <laughs> so that rising interest rate is also concerning for the capitalists because they know that that will increase the cost of all that borrowed money. <laughs> so over the past couple of years, especially, but even before this, the amount of money borrowed by central governments uh, is, especially the last two years, is astounding. The, the, the amounts are ridiculous. And they've really only gotten away with it by record low level, keeping the interest rate at an extremely low, low level. So the fact that it's starting to go up now, it has huge implications uh, for servicing that debt, uh, for the and for the world economy as a whole, actually Rosenberg says they're risking tanking the entire economy by raising the interest rate. But but they don't have any other choice. Um, anyway, this is related to, I guess we've already mentioned modern monetary theory, which has kind of become vogue. I think not even just on the left, almost in liberal circles, as they've been struggling to know what to do. But yeah, I guess how this all related it: what is money, the inflation, the interest rate. Uh, I guess this gets right into the solutions. Like, what do we do? Um, so, uh, yeah, do you want to maybe <laughs> talk about this? Like, what are the main ideas in the movement that are being argued? We already talked about the corporate profiteering. But what is being proposed on the left, I suppose, to deal with this problem? Well, the left really doesn't have an answer for inflation beyond having a go at corporate profiteering, that they, the left, the soft left, is afraid of the class struggle. And so they think, okay, you can just print money. You can just print money and then spend that on social programs. And the reality is there has been massive money printing, massive, massive money printing. They call it quantitative easing. And that is central banks, they said technical effect of quantitative easing is central banks buying government debt. But this is not, it's, uh, that's not real money. It's, it's imaginary created money. And now the governments have got all this extra money and big banks and corporations, they've also been buying their debt. And so they've got extra money. This all feeds out into the economy as well as interest rates being at you know, a quarter of 1% and stuff like that. So the, the, the left says, this is fine. This is fine. You, you can use this to pay for social programs. When the reality is there's been this quantitative easing. It hasn't been used to pay for social programs. It's been paid for, used to pay for corporate bailouts. You've got the wage subsidy. You've got various other forgivable loan programs. It's, it's, hundreds of billions of dollars in Canada is trillions of dollars internationally and all of this debt and all of this debt. So really the, 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 the reformist left has no answer to this. They just say, don't worry about inflation. Don't, don't worry about it. You can print this money, but it does lead to inflation. It is leading to inflation even before uh, the Ukraine war or anything like that. And, and, and this is bit, this is going to be the issue of uh, the generation. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think it put, really puts a nail in the coffin of the argument of, <laughs> I think, of the, the libertarian free marketeers, leave the state out of it, leave the state out of it. What you've had is the, a massive amount of, basically the state to the rescue. And everyone argued that. Even the most right-wing, the most free market people were arguing state to the rescue. Uh, and echoed, as you said, by the reformists. I mean, the corporate wage subsidy was actually an NDP idea in the beginning. The state paying corporate wages. Astounding that that came from the left. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, these ideas, I think it just shows the bankruptcy of reformism that, that can't argue and doesn't know how to argue anything 
or doesn't have any idea. It's been so far in the past. Organize anything that is a, is not within the framework of the capitalist system. <laughs> uh, and that's fundamentally what's happening here. So yeah, all these ideas, the, the, the printing of money, uh, uh, Keynesian debt financing solutions, uh, they, they all, they all, if you notice the common thread here is they all don't touch the market. They don't touch private ownership of the means of production. They simply are one fancy magical way of attempting to delay the inevitable, I think. Uh, and some even deny that there is an inevitable. It's like denying that there's material reality, that there's actually an economy of real things being exchanged underneath all of this money that's being pumped in. Um, yeah, so I think that that is quite clear uh, going on here. But yeah, what is the... Uh, actually, before we get into it, I was going to take a... I almost forgot there. I wanted to take a short commercial break. You're listening to Fight Back Radio this week in the Canadian Revolution. We are a revolutionary Marxist organization in Canada. We are fighting for a socialist solution to inflation, to rising cost of living, to to uh, rising inequality, to war, uh, to racism, to all forms of oppression. Uh, and if you are interested, uh, you're not just listening to this podcast, but you want to do something about it, you have to get involved. Contact us. You can go to our website, marxist.ca, where you can read our analysis of Canadian politics uh, we are members of the International Marxist Tendency. You can go to Marxist.com, check out our international website, uh, which I really is a treasure trove of analysis and theory um, internationally. So yeah, but get involved. Join us in the fight for socialism. Um, yeah, so let's get back into it. Uh, that's what, I guess, what is being done and what the, what is being argued in the movement about what to do with inf the, I guess, inflation and the the... The rising debt and and everything. Uh, what is the right wing saying? Yeah, so you've got people like uh, Pierre Polyev, the the lead candidate for the Conservative Party right now, and and he's been railing against inflation. He's been railing against debt. He's been railing railing against money printing. Uh, he's been calling it yet yeah, just inflation, attacking Trudeau. And, and and actually, he's been quite populist about it, saying all these low interest rates and money printing goes to pad the bottom line of billionaires and bankers. That's quoting uh, a senior conservative. He's attacking the billionaire class. So, uh, so it's a good bit of uh, Trumpite populism right there. And, uh, and so we can appreciate the irony. And he's not wrong. It, that it ha it does pad the bottom line of billionaires, and it do and the money printing does cause inflation, but he's silent about wage subsidies and corporate bailouts and stuff like that. He's he's blaming the very very small amount of supports that are going to working class people, like the Serb, uh, two thousand dollars a month uh, subsistence wage during COVID that uh, you know they're attacking that even though like 10 times more money went to corporations than went to working class people and what his is his solution well it's charity and it's raise interest rates which will tank the economy and cause unemployment so under capitalism it is pick your poison do you want to be poorer by inflation going up by five, six, seven percent a year? Everybody's on average poorer. Or do you want to be poorer because you've lost your job under Polyev and uh, and all your services and healthcare is privatized and education is privatized and everything's uh, all, all of the public services are non-existent uh, and are, are now part of the commodified sector so pick your poison that these are the two different ways they make the workers pay whereas we say make the bosses pay yeah exactly i think it's it's the height of hypocrisy for a career conservative politician to be <laughs> talking like this but this is a trumpite type discourse actually uh he's appealing he is Due to the lack of a, the left doing really calling out <laughs> this stuff and attacking the capitalists and attacking the Trudeau government for what they are doing in bailing out capitalism, 
someone like Pierre Polyev can come in uh, and it's dangerous, actually. That's why we need an anti-capitalist. We need an anti-establishment, like left wing, uh, a voice. You need a movement. And that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build that that voice for socialism that can point the, the finger at the capitalists, because otherwise you have a guy like Polyev dishonestly uh, pointing the finger at uh, um, the uh, at the government, at Trudeau, at the the, the printing of money. Uh, when really he doesn't actually care about that, to be honest. I think he's just using it. Uh, and his hypocritical stuff about working class people paying for the financial elites is just hypocrisy and extreme. The guy, the man has never worked a job in his life. Uh, and he's been a career politician that has been has been legislating in favor of corporate interests for, for a couple of decades, almost a couple of decades now. So <laughs> that is the height of hypocrisy. Although a dangerous discourse coming from the right while there is no no discourse denouncing the capitalist system in the mainstream left uh, yet. Um, so yeah, really, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Capitalism is, uh, it's really the double-edged sword now. You're either paying through cuts to social services, which the rising interest rate eventually is going to make inevitable. Yes. You raise the interest rate to combat inflation, the debt, the massive record debts that the governments have at all levels, provinces, federal, municipal, will now be so <laughs> costly to service that they'll pass the buck on to who? Not the bosses, <laughs> onto people like you and me, working class people, students, and there'll be a big push. We need to deal with the debt and there'll be a tax. Oh, don't be, don't be irresponsible. It's like, well, who's irresponsible? The people that took the money or the people that you're asking to pay for the money? Um, so I think, yeah, this is really the situation that we're, we're faced with. So working class people are either going to have to, well, probably both. You have, to, you, get, you have to pay with austerity or inflation or both at the same time. And I think that this is going to be increasingly the, the situation. But, you know, we don't want to be cynical. We don't want to just explain <laughs> the horrible situation and all the bad stuff that people are arguing. Uh, the whole point of this podcast is for us to show that there is a solution. There is a way out. There is a reason also to be optimistic and hopeful. Uh, and I guess that's what we can hopefully end off on here. Um, yeah. What, what should we be arguing for in the movement? What is the, you know, the, the socialist solution uh, to this? Maybe Alex, do you want to say a few yeah, words about I, actually, this? Before I get into that, that let's actually remember what happened in the 1970s is there was stagflation stagnation and inflation so to stimulate the capitalist economy they wanted to print money lower interest rates but that created more inflation and to get deal, deal with inflation they wanted to you know, raise interest rates and tank the economy even more so that's the, that's the danger for them, that they could end up in a situation of stagflation, that, that whatever they do, it makes the other side worse. And the point is, it's the crisis of capitalism. Now, as, as Bill Killington said, it's the economy, stupid, right? It's the crisis of capitalism. And the reformists always try to sort of juggle to ignore the crisis of capitalism. Yes, they were in favor of all these corporate bailouts, and which... Total corruption in implementing them. Actually, Polyev had some interesting numbers that the, def the deficit was about $350 billion. The money printing in Canada was also about $350 billion. Right? So that's a big crisis. And as the interest rates increase, the debt servicing, that becomes the largest government department. There is no capitalist, there is no reformist way of getting out of this and socialist solutions are the only one you have to be prepared to ditch capitalism that is the solution so first of all well in the immediate impact of inflation five six seven percent a year workers need a raise the labor movement needs to organize and say we will not accept wage uh, restraint we will not ex accept wages less than inflation. This is known as a COLA clause, a cost of living allowance. So all union contracts, all workers' contracts should have an inflation COLA clause. 
and unions need to be fighting for that. When it, and sadly, we've got horrendous conditions within the labor movement of the, the labor leaders not willing to fight. So actually in Ontario, there's like a 1% wage cap and that's a 4% wage cut right now. That's unacceptable. Unions need to say it's unacceptable and be willing to strike to back that up. Secondly, all right, corporate profiteering, how do we deal with that? Open the books. Open the books. No corporate secrets. No secrets at all that will see what their rate of profit is and how, how they're profiteering. And, and when we see that, then we have to deal with it. That means workers' control, workers' management, nationalization, so that there is actually a fair, fair price. In terms of supply chain, well, we need a socialist plan of production to end the anarchy of the, the capitalist market. That's what we need, socialism. We've, instead of bailing out these corporations, we should be nationalizing them. We, sh we should be expropriating them. They've had so many, we've actually paid for many of these corporations dozens of times over. You know, they say there's no money to nationalize. In fact, the pipeline, what is it? The, um, the Trans Mountain pipeline is now went from 7 billion to $21 billion. They've got money for that. They've got money for corporate bailouts, but there's no equity. There's no ownership. We need ownership. We paid for these co companies already, and you, but you put it under democratic workers' control and a socialist plan of production for need and not for profit. And you nationalize the banks. And that's why we control, we control money supply to make sure that it is accurately reflecting what is the real economy. And so people can use the resources rationally in a socialist manner, democratically. That's the way to raise the, to, to confront the rising standard of the cost of living and in, instead transfer the wealth from the rich to the poor and create a socialist economy. Yeah, exactly. I think these are the ideas, the real socialist ideas. We, this used to be something that was de talked about in the movement that was demanded by the, by the labor movement. Is it, is it, we don't, we don't accept capitalism. We don't accept private ownership of the means of production. This is not our system. It actually hasn't even been around for that long <laughs> uh, in the history of humanity. Uh, so yeah, we need to have demands and the working class needs to have demands and the left needs to have demands that go against the system because, because the as we we're discussing inflation, inflation is inevitable. Uh, austerity is inevitable. Crisis is inevitable. Corporate greed, profiteering are inevitable phenomena of the system. And if the left starts from accepting the market, accepting private ownership of the means of production, and simply uh, trying one magic financial uh, policy or another to try to, it, it's very short term. It's very short sighted, actually. It doesn't get us anywhere and it doesn't get the movement anywhere. And it only kicks the can down the road at best <laughs> at, and actually at worst it's creating the, the the mmt printing money stuff is creating the mother of all public debt crises and it is the direct cause of inflation so uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, i think the left needs to, we need we need a socialist policy as you have outlined here uh, to to really see us out of this nightmare situation uh, um, yeah, as we quite often said, this is the, 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 the choice is socialism or barbarism, right? And I guess on the topic of barbarism, uh, some people could probably always say, yes, but you still have the war in Ukraine. Uh, so what are you going to do about that? That's going to increase wages. Well, we discussed it the past couple of weeks, but to reiterate, I think everything that we've been talking about here and what you're talking about here is also, it, it necessitates an internationalist approach, right? We are part of an international, the international Marxist tendency, and we are fighting against imperialism. We are fighting against war. We are fighting against the capitalists in every country. Uh, we have section in Russia. 
Uh, a, we have been had comrades that have been getting arrested by Putin for protesting the war. We are fighting against the hypocrisy of Western imperialism and NATO. And really, we need to revive the traditions of the Marxist movement in the, in, in the, the concept that the main enemy is at home. Uh, we fight against imperialism, we fight against war, uh, and we're fighting for an international proletarian revolution uh, uh, to stop war, to stop this nightmare, uh, and to stop the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the rising inequality and all of the problems that we see today. So really, that's the, that's the international socialist response that must be defended uh, uh, in the movement. Uh, well, yeah, we've been going on for almost an hour here. I don't know if you have any final words on this, Alex, uh, on the topic of inflation or anything else. Well, I think, I think we, we can win this fight. And, well, the working class can win this fight, but things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. And, and, and you're seeing it. Inflation causes class struggle. That, that is a lesson from history. In fact, you know, what is the cause of many revolutions? Rising cost of living. The cost bread riots, cause of the French Revolution. That is a major driver of class struggle. That actually to talk about the high gas prices, they try to put this sort of uh, pro NATO stuff. Oh yes, uh, we'll, we'll pay higher gas prices for the glory of Ukraine. Well, that lasts about three days until it comes to wage negotiations. And if people can't pay their rent, and if they can't put food on the table, and they can't send their kids to school, that is a major driver of class struggle. And the bureaucrats at the top of the unions, well, they do everything in their power to try and keep a lid on this. But the reality is no bureaucracy is stronger than the forces of history. No bureaucracy is stronger than the working class. So working class people will demand that their wages keep up. And that will cause strikes. And as part of those strikes and as part of that class struggle, we'll explain how the inflation, the austerity, the rising cost of living, all of it is an inevitable consequence of capitalism. And the revolutionary organization will get stronger and stronger. The international Marxist tendency will get stronger and stronger if we are able to explain these ideas to people. So we need everyone who's listened to this. You need to help workers fight. You need to wait, help workers fight for higher wages to keep up with inflation. And then through that process of class consciousness, join a revolutionary organization that can overthrow capitalism so we don't have to deal with inflation. We don't have to deal with war and austerity and environmental crisis and all of the evils of this system. Join us. You have been listening to This Week in the Canadian Revolution, where we analyze the events of the class struggle, the turbulence and polarization brought upon by the crisis of the capitalist system in order to prepare activists for the coming revolutionary events so that we can fight back and build socialism in our lifetime. You can find us at marxist.ca and we will be doing this podcast every week. So we hope that you tune in again.